the Zone 3 Podcast. Man, we're super excited. Today oh, we're yeah. joined by, well, first let's introduce ourselves. So I'm Robert. Yes, and I'm Reggie. And this is Zone 3 Podcast, and we are super lucky to be joined by none other than Toby. Mr. Toby MRI Gilk. Safety yes, Tobias himself. Gilk. <laughs> MRI Safety Guru himself. Yes, so uh, <laughs> thanks <laughs> for joining guys. us. By the way, he flew in from Kansas City. Is it your first time in the Valley here? Uh, Phoenix no, Valley? No, I've been through for, unfortunately, just for meetings and such, you know, half a dozen times. I've never really spent any time in the Valley, and unfortunately, this trip... It's, it's going to be like one. everyone else. Yeah, but you, you dodge the heat that way because <laughs> right. at least your Uber driver has some AC. Cause, and it's only going to get worse, by the way. Have you been here before in the summertime? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So you're aware. Um, it's yes. miserable for those who have never been to Phoenix in the summertime. Those that live here for years and say that you get used to it are liars. <laughs> <laughs> it's a dry heat, they say. Well, either way, it's miserable. So, <laughs> but, uh, so we have uh, Toby here today to join us for the topic of, well, first of all, you're an architect. So if you would just kind of introduce yourself. Sure. Um, explain like how you got into MRI. Talk about your kids. By accident. Or, yeah. <laughs> yeah, anything. So, yeah, go ahead. Uh, well, okay. So my... My professional origin story, uh, <laughs> if you want to call it that. Everyone loves origin stories. So. Um, so I, in my undergraduate, I did theater design and production. So I, I was the guy the, you know, who did lighting design, sound design for stage shows and that kind of thing. Um, and I, I more or less worked my way through my undergrad doing that. And I realized at some point that I was much more interested in the theaters as a building than in the productions that went on inside of them. And so I decided I was going to go to architecture school and I was going to be the next great theater designer of the world. Um, and I probably should have looked into this before you know, <laughs> jumping in the deep end, but that's not my nature. Um, and when I was in architecture school, I discovered that, oh, wow, there are really two firms at the time in the United States that do a significant amount of live theater design. And I didn't really want to work for either one of them um and i was like wow. okay well crap you know we'll start over you know what am i going to do with this so i decided oh i'm just going to go out i'm going to be you know joe bob the average architect or whatever mm -hmm. um and so i graduate with my master's in architecture i go to work at this small town uh small town firm um that had no healthcare experience whatsoever um uh, but they've been trying to like you know, kind get in, in with there, the right? local hospital um, nice. for years and years. And just as I get there, um, the guy who is director of design and construction for the local hospital finally relents because the, the principals that I was working with, you mm -hmm. know, they were, were always after him. You know, come on, give us a test project. Right. So the des director of design and construction at the hospital relents and he's like, okay, if I give you something, it's going to be scut work. You know, you're right. going to have to prove yourself. And they're like, fine. Hey, we got this new kid. You know, we'll give him to you. Whatever you want him to do, he'll do for you. You know, and they more or less <laughs> gifted me to the hospital. That was awesome. So I converted a large storeroom to uh, an office for the director of surgical services and uh, designed the installation of a pneumatic tube station in the ICU. Oh, nice. Um, and I guess the folks at the hospital liked me, and I guess they liked what I did for them. Um, because, so I started with the firm in, what, June or something like that after graduation. Um, so we're now in October, and um, the hospital comes to the firm and says, okay, things have been going really well. We got this project. We're not sure you're going to want it. Right. You know? And the principals of the firm said, oh, yeah, we want it. And they're, no, 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 wait, you know, you probably want to know what this is before you agree to it. Um, and they, okay, well, tell us what it is. Um, they said, well, our CFO, we've been knocking on his door for years to get a new MR. And he's constantly came back and told us, you know, it's not in the budget, it's not in the budget. So it's October. And he says, okay, I will fund it out of the current year's budget. If what year was this, by the way? Do you remember? This was what was the budget? <laughs> Ninety-seven. Oh wow! Okay, nice. Um, um, he said, "I will, I will fund it out of the current year's budget if I can begin amortizing it in the current year, the right. current year's deductions, which means we have to scan a patient that calendar year." Oh, is that the stipulation? 
in, for, right. uh, I don't know from accounting, but right. you know, <laughs> to amortize the equipment, you have to put it into use. Right. Um, and so that meant this is November. <laughs> well, it was the end of October. It was the beginning of November before we got all the okay. ducks lined up because right. uh, we had to we had to make special arrangements with the State Department of oh, Health. Right. We had essentially had to say the way it normally works is. You know, the architects and the engineers, they draw up all of the plans, they submit it to the state, the state takes their time and reviews it and says, well, I like this bit and I don't like this bit, and, you know, would you redo this part and, you know, I need more information on this. Right. Of course, none of that was possible in the time frame that we had. So we made a special arrangement with the, um, the state um, inspector and said, look, we're going to give you the drawings as soon as we complete them. You're going to get them kind of, you know, chapters. You're not going to get the whole novel all at once. Um, and But we make this promise to you because when we send you the drawings, we're also sending them to the contractor to build it. Here's the promise. You see anything on the drawings that you don't like, that you have a question about, you think it's not up to snuff or whatever, you say the word and we will tear out whatever has been built. Whatever you object to, whatever you find unacceptable, we will tear it out. No questions asked, no fight, no fuss. Oh, wow. You know, right. um, and we will make sure that the end product, the final version of this, is going to meet your standards. This is like every architecture's dream at this point, right? Uh, or nightmare if you're kind of thrown oh. in the deep end if <laughs> okay. you've only been practicing right. for six months. <laughs> um, right. The other important part of the story is architects are trained as generalists um, because you might be working on a church this week and you might be working on an office building in next week and a hospital the month after that and so you need to be able to switch gears and switch your focus oh, right. so architects get really good at figuring out what they don't need to know about a particular project right. so i'm young and dumb i don't i don't even know that this is a skill much less do i have this skill <laughs> um and so I'm like, oh, I'm doing this MRI project. I need to know everything there is to know about MRI. Right. Now, this is 97, so this is before right. MRI safety was really a thing. Right. Um, and I just became enthralled with the technology. I'm like, so we're aligning the magnetic orientation of every molecule in my body. You right. know, that right. is like the coolest thing ever. Right. And then after we align it, we're essentially going to go and we're going to thump the aligned, you know, <laughs> exactly. molecules. Not and we're going to listen to the emissions that come off of the thump. This is the coolest thing right. in the world. Like math scientist stuff. Right. right. <laughs> it's awesome. You know, somebody wrote this up in a science fiction novel, and it's only <laughs> that we're incredibly lucky that we actually get a play with this right. toy. So... So I'm totally geeking out on what an MR is and how it works and that kind of thing at the same time that I'm, like, designing this facility. So the hook is set. So right. I am, like... <laughs> You're already in, right? I, I am in. I, I, I'm fully committed to, to MR. Um, the project, we wind up, we scan the first patient um, on this magnet. December 29th. Oh, wow. So two, two days, days before. Fair, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah we're my moving. My brother's birthday, by the way. Shout out. Um, <laughs> and it was, it was crazy. And, and the project, there were lots of people involved in that project who deserve a lot of credit. Wow. Um, because any one of them could have been the roadblock that, that made it impossible to happen. So, so that happened. So I'm, I become Mr. Radiology for the hospital. Right. So that's what they call Reggie, <laughs> where we work. <laughs> so after that project, you know, I'm I am the go-to guy for designing all of the projects in radiology, um, and I do you know gamma cameras, and I do a, a CT sim for the radiation oncology oh, pro nice. program, and a bunch of different stuff. So then, uh, 2002 rolls around. And I've changed firms, but I'm still doing work w with the new firm uh, for that hospital. And they're installing a, a new MR. Right. Um, and the head tech, who I worked with on the previous project, essentially hands me then the original ACR white paper on MR safety. It says, this talks about zones and access controls right. and... I can't make heads or tails of it, but it's all about architectural stuff, so surely you can figure this out. And he hands it to <laughs> me, and he go, says, right? whatever it says to do, you're going to do for this project. Right. Okay. All right. Um, so I wind up kind of throwing myself in the deep end again, only this time it's not 
MR as a technology, it's MR safety and sort of the physical environment piece of it. And honestly, I was a bit exasperated um, that they're really, you look at all the stuff there is for ionizing radiation and you right. have shielding and you're going to have to have a medical physicist and you're going to have to get it validated. And these are requirements, and, not even guidelines, right? Right. Requirements. You know, stacks and stacks <laughs> of exactly. standards and, and requirements for, for ionizing radiation. And, I, you know, you turn to what, what there was in 2002 for MRI, it's like, you can do whatever you want. <laughs> you know, here's this new document, and we we hope you follow some of the stuff it says in here. But otherwise, good luck. <laughs> knock yourself out. <laughs> Figure it out. <laughs> so I read the document, and I can't make heads or tails of it. Um, and so I'm like, well, they told me I have to follow this, so I better figure out what it means so that I can do what they want me to do. Right. So I'm like, okay, a list of authors on this paper. Who's this kennel? You know, you know oh, yeah. <laughs> I better, you know, figure out who this guy is and call him up. So I called Dr. Canal, <laughs> who was incredibly gracious and right. took my call. Great guy. Um, and I know you guys have spoken with him yeah. and had him on the podcast. Um, but she has a man crush. <laughs> <laughs> hey, man. Easy to do. <laughs> um, so I chatted with Dr. Canal three, four times over the course of this project as I'd, I'd sort of figure out the first steps I need to know and I'd, okay, all right, I'm good. I'm gonna go off and do that until I, you know, hit the wall and then I go back to him and I call him up again and say, okay, thank you for that previous piece. Now, how do I get from there to the next part I need to be? Right. Um, so throughout this process, like I say, I'm, I'm amazed, flabbergasted that, that there are no, zero at that time, you know, codes or standards or right. minimum requirements for the physical environment for MRI, right. um, which I now, because I've been doing work throughout the radiology department. In hindsight, I'm, it's concerning, right? <laughs> very much so. Right. You know? And time. so I'm, I'm the guy who I'm, I'm like, well, this is wrong. Right. I'm going to fix this. Love you know? that. Yeah. Um, and so I wound up becoming involved with um, FGI, Facilities Guidelines Institute, That's which is awesome. an organization that writes hospital design standards. Um, it's a special code, if you will, um, all about <clears throat> planning and design of, of hospitals. Um, you found yourself quite the niche. Or niche, as some people pronounce, but those weird people are, <laughs> are the same people who say tomato. <laughs> it's niche. What do you say, actually, before I put my foot in my mouth? <laughs> Too late. Pull. <laughs> you say niche or niche? I'm, I'm probably a niche guy. but yeah. you know. I'm a We're, niche guy, too. Yeah, so am I. All right. So, yes, you find your small, yourself a small niche, which is basically just what? Radiology, architectural, MR design consultant? Well, so the okay, so the firm that I work with now, um, there's a parent organization. the 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 group that I work with is uh, Radiology Planning, which, right. as the name suggests, is all about planning design of radiology facilities. Mm -hmm. So we do um, equipment planning services, um, equipment siting design, um, evaluations of workflow to try and figure out okay in existing facilities or planned new facilities, you know, how do we make the most effective and efficient use of these multi-million dollar investments in right. these pieces of equipment, right? Right. Um, and still maintain the safety aspects. And right. Just, well, I guess like to so transition to today's topic, like what would you say step one would be when somebody does come to you with a proposal? I'm guessing it would be like, well, what is it that you're putting in? A 1.5, a 3T, a 7T? Because that's going to... Right, because th that's what I'm... What's your, yeah, what's your square footage? Where are you located within the hospital? So... So you're identifying a lot of the things that are sort of the prototypical questions that you ask about design and construction projects. Um, I actually like to start a little bit further upstream. Oh, um, and I like to ask them questions about who are your patients? Oh, you're gonna, you know, like ortho stuff. Like right. Exactly, right. right. Are, are you doing post-surgical patients oh, in smart. MR? Right. Um, are you doing... Uh, do you have a, a large bariatric population? Are you doing PEDS patients? That's if you're doing PEDS it patients. It kind of paints the picture of how you think. And actually, kudos to you because it tells me that you are more of an empathetic person. You're right. actually considering. Uh, I, don't, I don't know about empathy, more, but. Well, I don't know more. <laughs> I'm trying to compliment you on your <laughs> Well, thank you. No. You seem less. Well, I'm and, very empathetic. And I'm, sure yeah. you're very, I'm sure you're also very analytical, but you're also, I don't know, it just seems like you see the bigger picture of it all versus, right. versus more of a numbers guy. Well, I, 
yes, I, that, that's something that I would aspire to. Um, most, the way that architects are trained to practice is you are done when, with the ribbon cutting, right? You're right. done when the blueprints go to the, the contractor and um, you know, hopefully you have some oversight of the, the actual building process. But you know, your responsibility is over at some point before they scan the first patient, right? The hospital, the imaging center, other than the fact that they want it to be as short as humanly possible, they don't give a damn about the design and construction process. Right. They care about patient care. They care about how effective is this? How efficient is this? How is this going to flex with my changing needs over time? Um, and so when design and construction questions are all about um, what's your budget, how many square feet, you know, what piece of equipment are we dropping in what part of the hospital, all of that is is absolutely necessary, and I don't mean to, to, to belittle any of those questions, but none of those questions are what the hospital cares about or will care about after ribbon cutting day. Right. If, you know, if they buy a decent piece of equipment and the architects and engineers do their job correctly, um, that piece of equipment should be providing patient care for 10, 15, maybe 20 years, right? right? So the questions to ask are not, what do we need to do to get this project to ribbon cutting day? The questions that, that really ought to be asked is, okay, once they start scanning their first patient, how is this going to work for them and how is that how is this facility this the the you know bricks and mortar piece of the building how will it allow them to change the way that they deliver care over time right because locking you know a facility into a solution even if it's the perfect solution for today Healthcare is churn. Oh, man. You know, whatever you do today, you're going to be doing something different next month, next year, well, whatever. Especially an MRI, right? Well, exactly. And maybe just to illustrate the point, I'm curious, like, what would you say is the difference as far as design goes with a facility that's primarily inpatient versus a facility that's primarily outpatient? So, so I'll I'll go back to my you know yeah. my. What My on, on these preemptory questions are you going to be doing? Right. <laughs> right. So, so who like are your patients? Stuff. Who who are your referrers? Um, you know, what's the different mix of studies? Right. Um, I guess I'm trying to get in your head. So, like, if somebody were to say we're going to be doing intra-op patients, both inpatients and outpatients. So, so I, my methodology is, I want somebody to explain to me or or identify for me every different workflow. patient type and workflow yeah. that walks through the door. So, if it's an interop patient, if it's a post-op patient, right. if it's a patient with limited mobility, or we have peds patients and we're going to be doing GA for, for the peds patients to facilitate the exams, I want the site to tell me every last different workflow process that they have based on different patients. Right. And then I'm going to say, okay, you have identified for me 17 different patient oriented workflows and each one of the workflows have these different elements in common they have um, how are we going to screen them right if they're in patients are we doing some of the screening on the floors you right. know oh. what screening is being done off off-site outside of the MRI suite what's being done inside the MRI suite do we have separate inpatient entrances to the MR suite from to segregate the inpatients from the outpatients Okay, great. But what services or functions are we providing for the outpatients because they're the people who get more square footage, right? right. That we're not providing to the inpatients. Are we providing, you know, patient belonging storage and ferromagnetic detection screening and what have you for the outpatients, but we're not doing it for inpatients because they come in through the back door because we don't right. want any of the outpatients to get freaked out by the vented patient, right. you know? Interesting does to say that. <laughs> does the layout dictate what services or care or functions we can deliver to different patient workflows? So my goal is we we identify in in a hospital setting if you have if you identify fewer than say eight 
patient workflows, you're not trying hard enough. Because I bet you, you have, you know, even if they're off book, informal, you know, right. oh, we have the ortho doc who, you know, replaces shoulders and these patients can't undress themselves. So now all of a sudden, even if they're going to go through the same physical spaces in the suite, we're going to, you know, write exceptions for the, you know, we're not going to gown these patients or we need to have a helper in them, right? you know, with that. Now all of a sudden you're defining different functional workflows, things that require different staff, different time allocations, different physical space demands, that kind of thing. So I'm going to lay out all of these different ones and I'm going to go, okay, screening for, you know, this one and this one and this one and this one all essentially need the same resources. So we're going to bundle those and we're going to have a screening function that, that services these. These guys, on the other hand, are weird or, or distinct from one another. And maybe I can group these two, but this one is just, this one is, is its own animal altogether. Right. So I begin finding the commonality between the separate workflows. If you right. don't do the separate workflows to begin with, you're just guessing at where it makes sense to combine and where it doesn't. Well, real quick, have you seen a difference in these workflows? Because of course, MRI has changed so much probably since you first designed your very first suite to design the suite oh. you just recently designed, right? Oh, like, hell yes. What's the biggest change that you've seen through that, that, that dynamic change? I'll, I'll give you a practical illustration of, of exactly that. So, so that MRI suite that I designed with the, the as far as I know, oh, yeah, it was the first, first one, one that was done with the ACR white paper. Curious yeah. if you would design it the same today. Oh, no. Okay. <laughs> oh, no way. Um, they say an expert is somebody who has made every ac accident or every mistake there is to make in a profession. You know? <laughs> an expert. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know that. And, and are too stupid to leave the profession partway through, you know, oh, they're too bullheaded. You know? <laughs> so so I, I'm, I'm very proud of that MRI facility I did in 2002, and I have no regrets about it, but I would absolutely do it different today, in part because – even if I would, you know, time travel back to 2002, I know more than I did then, and I would do things differently. But things are tremendously different in 2021 than they were 19 years ago. Right. Um, so the entire universe of MRI is so different um, that I, even if I only knew what I knew then, I think I would make different decisions. Right. But so I went back to that hospital. I was friends with the, the head MR tech. Um, and every chance I got, every excuse I got, I'd go back to the hospital because I was interested to find out right. how does this work over time? And so this was three years, four years after the project was complete. Mm -hmm. um, and I drop in on the hospital and the head tech is, he's, he's scanning a patient and he sees me through the door and he's like, hey, you know, give me 10 minutes. Uh, uh, I want to talk with you. So I'm just kind of hanging out in the the zone three space. Do uh, they screen the, you? Hey, hey kind of like now. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I'll see what you did there. Uh, <laughs> um, and um, I, I see through the open door, they have a breast coil on the table. And the head tech finishes up and he comes out and he's like, so glad to see you. And we start chatting and I'm like, hey man, I gotta ask you. you, you got the breast coil on the table. And at that point, Maybe my timeline of three to four years is not exactly correct, but um, the ACR had just published uh, some sort of opinion or guidance uh, okay. document about breast MR that essentially said, if you're going to be doing diagnostic breast, you really should be um, able to do um, image-guided biopsies because if you're just doing the breast imaging – and you localize a tumor, and now all of a sudden you're going to send that patient, you know, across the hospital in a gown with right. needle oaks, you know, right. do the do the biopsy in the magnet room, right? right. So, right. so that statement from the ACR had just come out a number of months before. So I walk in and I see the, um, you know, the breast coil, which at that time was still pretty cutting edge, you know, right. for sites to be doing that. And I ask him, I'm like, so are you guys doing biopsies in the room? 
and he was so proud of himself. You know, his chest like swelled up, and he <laughs> stood up extra straight, and he's you know, because that was a right breast imaging by itself at that point in time was a big deal. Big time. Breast yeah. imaging, bre- you know, image guided biopsies was a really big deal, wow. and he was justifiably proud. Right. I said, "What did infection control say?" Because when you had me design this space four years ago, and I asked the question, will this ever see interventional use, or is this strictly a diagnostic platform? The answer when I designed it was, this is strictly diagnostic. And I'm like, what did infection control say when you started doing interventional procedures right. inside the magnet room? All right. And as, as like, Swollen with pride as he was when he was telling me about doing breast imaging and uh, image-guided biopsies, it was like somebody let all the air out of him, and he became immediately really interested in the tops of his shoes, you know. <laughs> and you know, right. he, he was like, "We never told them. We never told infection control well, that we're doing I'm biopsies." Like, what, would, what would jumps out at you as the first co- cause of concern with that? Right. So. So one of the, the many ways that MR has changed over time is right. now we are doing you know, MR-guided interventions, right? <clears throat> if you do interventional procedures anywhere else in the hospital, what are you supposed to have, right? right. Uh, we have to have scrubbable surfaces, seamless floors, yep. um, hand sink in the room or hands-free access you know, to a hand sink somewhere else or hand washing station. It doesn't have to be a full scrub sink. Right. You know, now all of a sudden, if we're talking about interventional care, in every other part of the hospital where we do interventional care, there is a checklist right. of five, six, eight things yeah. that you have to provide, oh, you yeah. know, for infection control, infection prevention, if you're going to be doing interventional care. In MRI, like so many things in MRI, the change has kind of crept up on us mm-hmm. um, slowly. And so we really, internally, we have been bad judges of how much change there has been it's like you know putting the frog in the cold pot of water and turning the heat on really low you know as long as the temperature doesn't change quickly enough the frog will just sit there until the water boils you just described phoenix by the way (laughs) 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 we're all frogs toby (laughs) miserable but um i there there is so much change in mr right um, and those of us who are in it every day, who are soaking in, you know, Water, right? the change, yeah. oftentimes we are the worst ones at being able to see the magnitude of, of how much has changed and being able to recognize, holy crap, why are we doing interventional procedures in a diagnostic setting where we don't have any of the, the minimum expectations of infection control that w- Joint Commission would shut you down right. if you were doing, you know, biopsies in, you know, a broom closet, you know. Right. <laughs> and yet exactly. we're doing image guided biopsies in MR suites that from an infection control standpoint might as well be a broom closet, right. you know, because no one ever thought about air changes per hour or oh, scrubbable yeah. surfaces and that kind of thing. Right. See, I always think when you mention about like <clears throat> interventional stuff, I was immediately thought about surfaces. I never thought about airflow though. Yeah. So that's interesting. A lot of stuff that you don't even consider. Right. Um, I mean, we uh, we hope to appeal to a, a wide spectrum of of uh, viewers, I, anywhere from people who are just you know just a patient who is curious about MRI, who, all the way up to architects. But um, I guess I'm curious, like. Um, what would you say, like, how would you describe, like, the different zones and the purpose of the different zones and the reason why those different zones were, like, implemented? I guess it would be a good way. To- I feel like the zone, like, the designation to have zones is, I couldn't imagine not having that, those designations, you know? Right. Like, how much harder it would be to keep unscreened people out of... Because for every you know? zone, there's a defined expectation. Right. 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 So, yeah. That's so, so one of the most confusing things about the zones is everybody wants to map the zones right. on a room type, right? right? Zone four is the magnet room. Zone three is your control room. Zone two is the screening, you know, area. Zone one is is Check your reception or, or lobby, yeah, yeah. right? Um, 
And one of the challenges with that is that we actually define zone four as the magnet room, right? right. That, you know, once you are inside that space, you're in zone four. The, the difficulty is that none of the other zones actually technically map to a space. Right. Not in a universal sense. The, the entire zone concept is based on we're going to differentiate physical spaces that have different levels of risk. Right. If you're standing right next to the magnet, you are in the highest possible area of risk. And that, in order to kind of define it, I suppose they could have said, you know, the five gauss bubble or, or something like that, right. but they chose to define that, that space as you have direct physical access to the magnet. You are inside the room, right? right? And, and so they define zone four as that room. Right. All of the other zones are relative quantities of risk. Uh -huh. So um, zone three is, is you meet one of two or both tests. Either there is a an MR-related physical hazard present, the five gauss line pushes outside the walls of the magnet room, or you're near the quench discharge point. There, there is a potential physical hazard that is directly MR-related, and you are either in it, or there's an open door that gives you access, you know, to to zone four. Just for our, our audience that's very visual like me, do you mind real quick? We've got Dave. He's a producer, the man behind the camera. Yeah. Will you just bring up uh, just Google MRI zones just so we have a visual. So that people, as you're talking, can kind of like. Yeah. What's that top left one look like? Actually, Toby, I don't know. You, you pick one, maybe. I don't know. So the, that, that top left one is actually, that's the ACR's diagram uh, right there. Um, Perfect, thank you. We'll go screen on screen. So it's, uh, it's an illustration, and, and it's unfortunately it's part of what I'm, I'm afraid propagates the, the, the misinformation that the zones are specifically defined rooms. By rooms, yeah. Uh, so you think it should be defined based on like, um, r I guess, risk level right so so uh, let's take this diagram as an example chair, right sorry. so yeah. let let's make the assumption that the five gauss line is contained completely within the magnet room right, right. so there would be a zone three if it was a superconducting mr and and there was a quench vent now there are the new magnets that have so little cryogen and you don't actually have to have a vent nice. but let's assume that it's one of the you know sort of more typical magnets that that on the roof there's a quench vent right i didn't know there was magnets that you didn't need a vent but keep going I'm listening uh, they're, they're brand there, new yeah. um so on the roof of this building, there would be a zone three space where the quench vent came out because that's an MRI specific hazard, right? Okay. And so right at the quench vent, that's a zone three space. And, you know, you don't need to be screened for magnetic contraindications. But if you're the guy who's, you know, patching the leak in the roof, you should probably know what the hell that, you know, big candy cane coming out of the roof that has the warning <laughs> signage, what that means and what the indications are that you should get the hell away from it. Right. Um, so, so that's a zone three space because there is a MRI physical hazard that could be present there. Um, so the control room in this diagram that's identified as zone three if the five gauss line doesn't penetrate into that space, um, then it fails to meet the criteria of there being a, an MRI specific hazard right there. But that in, then we test the second criteria, which is can we go from that space freely into zone four? Right. Now is distance the factor or shielding or and or? So if we're talking about the magnetic field, it can be and or. You can either use shielding, um, magnetic shielding, and then conventional prototypical Which radio frequency. What is used for that? For magnetic shielding, it's steel plate. So, mm -hmm. so magnetism. You guys are giving me the great opportunities to kind of geek out on uh, some of my favorite <laughs> MR physics stuff. And among some geeks, <laughs> especially these guys. So, um, so X rays, right? Uh, 
vocabulary from from high school physics. If you ever took like high school physics or, or even geometry, a ray, right, is mm-hmm. a line. You know, right. it magnitude and direction. It just goes and goes and goes in whatever yeah. direction you like point. Like a tangent. Yeah, Factor. exactly. Yeah. We were talking about that earlier. It just it shoots in whatever direction it goes, and it keeps going and going and going until something stops it. Right. Right. X rays are rays. They travel in more or less a straight line until they hit something that knocks them off course or absorbs their energy. Right. Right. So a light bulb is, you know. Rays, right? right? Light rays are emitted, and it travels in a straight line, which is why we can create shadows, you know, and do sock puppets and that kind of thing. <laughs> um, and that's the way we think of electromagnetic radiation. But magnetism throws all that out the window. <laughs> magnetism is an orbit. It doesn't go from here, you know, to infinity and beyond. It goes back to the same spot it started from. It just loops around. So. One of the metaphors that I use, and, and forgive me, I think in metaphors, I can't think in a straight line. Um, <laughs> How ironic. <laughs> um, so if you think of the bore of an MRI as like a water slide, right? Right. On a hot summer's day, right? You go to the water park with the gazillion kids, right? You know, right. and you just watch them go down the water slide. Pew, and they shoot down, what's the first thing they do when they get to the bottom? Pee. They go back up. <laughs> Don't drink the pool water. Um, they go back up to the top and they go down again. And, zoop, 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 zoop. Oh, right. and so right. if you think of like the bore of an MRI, right, and the magnetism shoots down the bore, and as soon as it shoots down the bore, it's like, that was the most cool thing in the world. I'm going to do that again. And it you loops around, around and it goes like this, right? Right. So mag- can you show that Gauss line like for the, with a bore? What would be the keywords on that? Uh, I don't know. Um, yeah, MR magnetic uh, field MRI. Um, yeah, Gauss lines. If you put Gauss, that in, yeah. that should pop up. I'm trying to cater to all those audience members that are like me. Very visually stimulated. That was very good with coloring books. <laughs> 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 you know, it's funny. While we just got this dead time, I just mentioned. I found it interesting. There's quite the common denominator with people who are MRI like minded. And it's a lot of them have an artsy background, and you mentioned theater, which is an artsy background. Right. So I don't know, just kind of throw that in there, find it interesting. Yeah. Uh, there, there you go. go. So there's yeah. that board, and you can see the guy on the water slide right there. Right. Uh, what so happened, what happened to the water slide? <laughs> there yeah. it is. So so yeah, so magnet magnetism, magnetic flux is an orbit. It shoots down the bore, it circles back around and goes through again. So when we talk about magnetic shielding, well I guess before we talk about magnetic shielding, the the magnetic flux, those those orbit lines, the the path of the kids going back up through the water slide, right? right. If the material is non magnetic, if it's concrete if it's you know drywall stud wall kind of thing um magnetism doesn't see it it's it's as if it isn't there altogether right um and so your concrete wall that is great for a linac bunker does (laughs) nothing for magnetism right magnetism just goes right through it as if it wasn't even there um, and so when you have a magnetic field bubble, a three-dimensional you know, lozenge of space where the magnetic energy is zipping out and running around and circling back, um, and you build giant reinforced concrete walls, good on you. You did nothing, um, not in terms of containing the, the magnetism. If you want to contain the magnetism, it is going to get back to its point of origin. There is nothing you can do to prevent it from getting back to its point of origin. All you can do is give it a preferential route, make it easier for it to get back to its point of origin. So magnetism and electricity are Siamese twins, right? Mm-hmm. You don't get one without the other. They, they're a package deal, right? right? And it's actually really helpful because in a lot of ways we can think of magnetism as – sort of a strange electricity. So um, if we think of magnetism as electricity, and I know any physicists who are watching this right now, they're (laughs) 
you know, it's like fingernails on a chalkboard. Um, <laughs> it, it's it's technically incorrect, but it is good for illustrative purposes. Um, That's what we're all about here. <laughs> and like I say, I can't think in a straight line. I only think in metaphors. Right. Um, if we think of magnetism as behaving like electricity, what we want to do is we want to give it a better conductor. Air is actually a lousy conductor for magnetism. Right. What's a good conductor for magnetism? We know. Right. It's steel. It's iron. It's magnetic materials. What makes a magnetic material magnetic material is that it is a great conductor for magnetism. <laughs> so if we want if if we have a magnetic field that you know bulges way the heck out here and we don't want it to, um, what's happening is those magnetic flux lines are essentially doing this and right. we want to give them a shorter route right? shorter route so we're going to put a giant steel plate across their path and what's going to happen is those flux lines are going to go and hit that steel plate uh -huh. they want to go home whatever their plan was when they hit that steel plate they still want to go home right they don't change this slide huh something's changed right. about this so slide. now all of a sudden instead of giving them you know a gravel road the you know high friction you know pathway that that air normally is for them <laughs> now you've given them a freshly paved autobahn right? Oh, right and they hop in there and they're like express lane <laughs> and they're gonna zip they're gonna follow that steel shield until they it either ends or they jump out right. to return home to go back to where they were before so magnetic shielding Every MRI has has radio frequency shielding, and it does nothing for magnetism. Right. Um, so, if you need magnetic shielding, you need the radio frequency shielding plus magnetic shielding, um, and you can apply the magnetic shielding just to one wall or two walls or the floor or the ceiling or whatever. One of the challenges is with magnetic shielding, and and I, from a design standpoint, I try and do everything I can to steer clear of needing magnetic shielding. MR imaging is possible because of um, homogeneity in and around isocenter. Right. What screws up homogeneity? Magnetic field interference. What's the one of the primary sources in building of interference? Structural steel. You know the steel that goes into buildings. Right. The more more steel in and around the building, the more you have to shim the magnet, the more you wind up with inhomogeneities, the reduced, you know, X and Y field of view, you wind up in your sweet spot. Right. You know, now it becomes really difficult to do, you know, off center shoulders or hips or whatever, and you really gotta jam the patient to the side to get to the sweet spot where you can get those images. Um, the less you have to change the 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 physical environment and put more steel in the physical environment the, the that, more you yeah. protect the homogeneity of your magnet the more you protect the potential you know volume imaging volume um for that right. so the physical design of the space changes image quality image quality changes the life cycle of that piece of equipment if the radiologist is pissed off because they can't get decent shoulders and hips well, let's buy a new magnet, you know? <laughs> right. So if you don't put the magnetic shielding in when you can come up with other mechanisms for, for protecting the environment, um, then you preserve, you protect image quality, you protect the longevity of that piece of equipment, you improve the financial outcome for the, for the provider. I guess right. that kind of like brings me to one question I wanted to ask you as far as easier design goes, mobile or fixed. I think I already know the answer, but with fixed, do you have greater latitude as far as design goes but obviously you're restricted with square footage and all that but obviously with a mobile unit you're extremely restricted um yeah so mobile units are tough yeah um, it's a different breed right so there are so many compromises that have to be made just to put a 17,000 pound magnet on a trailer <laughs> right. to run it on the interstate you know right. um how do you turn this thing off? <laughs> <laughs> um, I heard a great story. Um, one oh. of the things I love about MR is there are no shortages of great stories. <laughs> right. Um, 
So a facility that had an NIH grant and was doing these research studies and was, uh, they were doing MR spectroscopy on cancer patients and reporting it as a part of a big research, multi-center research study. Um, and they have these patients who they're tracking, you know, the, their cancer therapy progress right. by doing um, spectroscopy studies of the tumors. Um, and, you know, they're watching over time the choline peaks, you know, begin to diminish as the therapies are working. So patients come in every other week or whatever, you know, for, for these sort of periodic reviews. So they have the magnet two days every other week or something like right. that. So they come and then the study techs show up at the, the mobile trailer um, and they're doing the patients that they've done you know 20 times before and all of a sudden the spectrographic analysis looks like just somebody just totally messed up off, huh? you know yeah, yeah. there's something wrong with the magnet you know you know damn it, we're not going to be able to use today's, you know, <laughs> got to call in a service call, got to get the guy from GE, Siemens, Phillips, whatever. Um, so they have a service call, and the guy comes in, and he's like, no, the magnet's fine. Huh. It's like, you know, patient must have eaten something or whatever to right. throw their spectro all the way off. And No, it doesn't work like that. <laughs> um, and so they rescan the patient. Still, the spectro is way off, you know, mm. on the, on the second day. Turns out that when they um, designed the parking pad for the the mobile trailer, they went on the cheap and they only put um, the non-ferrous reinforcing under the area where they thought the magnet was going to be directly above. Uh, and then they used just conventional rebar, you know, like where the wheels were, and right, you know, uh, right. Um, and the guy who was driving the the tractor that week. <laughs> Didn't know didn't where the know. sweet spot was, right. and so he parked it, you know, eight feet away from where it was supposed to be, <laughs> and so they parked the the magnet over the steel rebar in the in the slab, and wow. so, um, you know, you start getting all of these different spectral distortions because now you have this a bunch really of just steel. shows you how important it is, right? Right. So, so mobile systems are. Even if you do everything perfect, like they had, you know, they had non-ferrous area directly under the magnet. You don't park the truck the same way, <laughs> you get a different result. Right. Now, they were doing spectro, and I think that, you know, you're pushing your luck, you're doing spectroscopy on a trailer to begin with. Um, but, you know, they had to do it for this multi-center, multi-site trial. Um, so... Yeah, anytime you're doing trailers, you you throw in this additional level of complexity. Um, my feeling is for mobile trailers, um, from a safety standpoint, you should be providing everything to the MR patients who are walking out to the mobile trailer that you would otherwise provide to a fixed oh, yeah. site. A fixed site. So, now the trailer only comes really with zone three and zone four. Um, right. So your zone one, zone two functions really should be provided inside the bricks and mortar right. you know, hospital. And you should figure out a way to kind of minimize the interruption of that immediate sequence, one to two to three to four, you know. So if the trailer is parked all the way over there on the far side of the parking lot, you know, that becomes really problematic. If right. it's Which it, typically happens. Right. Um, if you can park it in a spot where essentially you go, you know, out from your zone two prep space and you just walk across, you know, a uh, uh, outdoor loading dock or a canopied entry or whatever and you just kind of go straight into the magnet now you you more closely approximated what you would have in a you know full bricks and mortar yeah all right well i actually since we had toby coming time. on architect i uh took upon myself <laughs> wanted to check out how easy it actually was going to be to create a mri suite kind of fully laid out outpatient facility and i got about three like drawn out designs out and i'm like okay this is zone one because you really in your head you want to give these zones rooms like you were talking about right and it's never just that easy right like you, you know there's hallways you got to consider and the way you lay things out it actually was a lot harder than i was expecting so 
Uh, He's yeah, been very proud of this, as he should be. Uh, it's I mean, a work in progress. Ooh, it's a work. I thought it was going to be so much better by the time we got here. But so this is what I like to call Zone 3 Imaging Center. And there is a lot of missing pieces, and that's why we have a professional architect who's done this <laughs> so many times to help us finish this thing up. So what I want you guys to do is, you know, really, you know, even if it's just on pen and paper, just do your best to try to design your own little layout. Because I, I feel awesome. like you can really learn a lot from it. And maybe before it's labeled, just at home, try to identify which is the three or the of the four zones. Right. Right. This diagram is kind of funny. And I want y'all to stay tuned to the end because I'm going to have this before Toby and then I'm going to have an after Toby <laughs> version of this. So I want you guys to check that out for sure. So we're going to get Dave to go ahead and take us through the main entrance here. And oh, yeah, Brick I use the right there. app SketchUp, which is really it's very user friendly so if you did want to take a chance there is a 30 day free trial that you can try exactly what I use for this so definitely check that out if you do want to do something fun like this but uh, so here's our reception so what we would consider this is kind of a zone one but literally when you step out of your bedroom right Toby that's technically zone one too right yeah so um, joint commission surveyors <laughs> have just gone nuts about wanting people to have zone signage um, yeah. and makes me crazy when you know surveyors come down on you know hospitals or imaging centers and say you know well, where's your zone one sign you know <laughs> right it's like where I could put I it in the it? parking lot <laughs> I could put it at the subway station you know right. I could put it outside my bedroom door you know <laughs> it's all zone one so from from a facility planning standpoint zone one is kind of meaningless right. um and i also think that from a signage standpoint zone one is meaningless i will go out on a limb and i know that this is not a particularly popular opinion i think labeling the zones as zones uh, other than you know the podcast you know of course um <laughs> labeling the zones there, as Toby. zones <laughs> <laughs> is the most pointless thing in the world Oh. Um, because who knows what the zones are? We do, yeah, right? That's true. And if we're uh, in the so facility, we already know, you know, oh, that door means I'm going it's into so the control true. room. I'm going into the magnet room. You know, right. I'm going into the, the equipment room where the five gauss line pit. All right. We know right. So right. what that means from, from a risk standpoint. And so the sign is not sharing. Really for those who don't know what it means, right? Well, that's the problem is yeah, the folks who don't know <laughs> what, you know, now entering zone four, you know, oh, good or bad or <laughs> how am I supposed to react to that? Yeah. You know, <laughs> so um, simply labeling it as zone one, zone two, zone three, zone four, in my mind is you're preaching to the choir. Right. The only people who are going to understand that are the people who understood it before you put the sign up. Right. If, well, on the other well, hand, sure. the sign says, you know, hey, look, beyond this door, there are these potential risks. You're not, not allowed to go past this door, you know, without an MR person, you know, escorting you back. Well, now all of a sudden you've communicated actionable information to a patient or a visitor or to, to somebody who is not familiar with the situation. Right. Um, and that, I think, is much, much, much more useful than saying, you know, now entering zone three. Right. Um, so yeah. so I, I, think I have a love-hate relationship with, with the zone designations. Right. Um, I think that they're really helpful thinking about organizing spaces. Um, but that's kind of where their utility stops. Right. Um, Unless people actually know what the access restrictions are, it's right. almost pointless. Right? Hazard information, knock yourself out. I, you know, I applaud anybody who wants to say, beyond this door, here's what you need to be worried about, and here's how we're controlling those risks. Right. Absolutely. Um, throwing up a sign that says now entering zone two because a joint commission surveyor you know right. is getting on your case about it is the biggest waste of everybody's time energy effort um, and worse than that worse than just being a waste is now all of a sudden people have this false sense of security of oh i've made the world safer right you know <laughs> no you haven't right you know you've you've allowed somebody to check a box on a survey form right but what you've done hasn't made anybody safer. Right. Well, check out our uh, 
Zone one bumper stickers and just a <laughs> free podcast tour. That's actually a clever idea. <laughs> um, you know, I, I feel defeated because I really, my goal was to make it to the end of this episode. Can I get a bathroom? Not going to happen. So promise you're not going to talk about me when I leave. All right. But I'll be back. All right. <laughs> so as we pro- kind of progress through this, now we're going to go to our actual, um, so this is check-in. So we're going to go to our zone two entrance here. So this is our zone two entrance, which you can actually see. That's the zone three door there. And this is where I kind of struggled the most because I'm like, do okay, do I put the FMDs out here or should I just leave all that right there? What if we do the IVs yeah. and then we kind of pull the patient and screen them? Like, how do you, you know, kind of plan for these type of layouts? Like, right. so uh, if you go to the next one, which is our IV starting room, I was like, okay, let me just go to the changing room first and then the IV starting room. <laughs> So they're going to change, get their IV, and then we're going to have them wait, and then we'll pull them into zone three. And, yeah, so this is kind of the zone three. Um, and, you know, got the uh, Metrosense FMD on the wall there. And here we go. I'm going to go on to actual – I mean, sorry, yeah, that, so now we're going into zone three. That was zone two, and here's zone three. Oh, so you have sort of an anteroom kind of, you know. Yeah, just to kind of right. keep it separate. That was the best way I could do it because I'm like, man, it's going to get confusing. They're going to, who who got screened, who didn't get screened, you know, like right. after you get your IV. It's a workflow, huge workflow issue for well, me. I, I think you're, yeah, no, you're touching on another really important issue, and that is, so zone two functions, right? right. What, are, what are we doing in zone two? Right. Um, okay, we are going to review the, the clinical screening form, right? right? Do you have any implants, foreign bodies, yada, 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 any surgeries? Right. Um, so we need to, for HIPAA, we need to have sort of acoustically private spaces where right. the tech or the MR person can, you know, can essentially it? conduct that and you know, right. Try and get honest and truthful answers as best as any of us can um, from patients. Um, and assuming that we're not going to essentially kick them to the curb because, oh, well, didn't I tell you I have a you know pacemaker? <laughs> right. um, um, then we're going to do the, the physical screening and we're going to, okay, I need you to get out of your street clothes and get into a gown. Or if you're at a site that allows patients in street clothes, you should still be making sure they're taking off their shoes right. and their, you know, giant rodeo belt buckle and, you know, a- anything that can be removed. So, so in zone two, we've already identified we're doing clinical screening. We're doing physical screening. You right. uh, correctly, I think, you know, IVs. have sort of the IV start area. Yeah. So we're going to do an IV function as well. And now all of a sudden we need to have a place for, you know, these MR patients to essentially camp out and wait their turn. Right. right. So we're going to have like a sub wait kind of function. So. One of the things that I think is a popular misconception about the zones is, you know, this room is, you know, this zone. And if we go from this room into the next room, now all of a sudden we have to go to the next zone, <laughs> right? Right. right. It, the, the functions, uh, you know, in zone two, we've already identified several different functions right. uh, associated with it. And so the zone two space can be two, three, four, 12, you know, separate spaces to respond to the different activities that really you know need to go on in those different areas right right and, and so moving into uh yeah zone three mm-hmm. and this is kind of our control room area so a lot of times in a lot of situations say you, the patient has an iv we're bringing them in and we're kind of screening them we you know in zone two making them spin and they're kind of you, you get something, right? You, you find they got maybe a bobby pin or something. You take it out. Now do you, you leave that in zone two and then move a patient on to zone three? And as you're in zone three, actually kind of reviewing, um, you know, the exam or whatever you do when you talk to the patient as you're walking them in, talking about, hey, it's going to be 30 minutes, try to hold still. Um, they're like, oh, I forgot. I got this, right? Almost happens right. so many times, right? Oh, I, f- I got this. Now yeah, as you're taking a picture. Never happens. How do you back? Nobody, everybody always remembers when, when you ask oh, yeah, them the I first time. Hey, <laughs> aneurysm clip. I forgot. <laughs> exactly. Oh, really? <laughs> so I feel like it's always important. And this was one of the new ACR, ACR guidelines is do that last stop, final check. Right. You know? And one of the, the best things to have. And before I even go too far, I just want to give a big, big shout out to Aegis. Can you go back to the original Zone 3 entrance? 
the you know uh ages man they do tech games but they've just been so supportive of the podcast and they've really been amazing so i just want to give those guys a big shout out they played a big part with toby being here today so thank you to ages yeah thank you guys uh, we really appreciate you guys joe is hilarious and so are you steve <laughs> also fun guys to hang around with so um yo for sure <laughs> we hear all these stories <laughs> right oh yeah for sure but yeah we actually the facility that we work with we use these tech gates we we hear from the patients a lot about oh man it reminds them almost every time oh, they see that sign they're like oh yeah i got this oh yeah i got that before they want to go into zone four and i feel like that you know it's it's almost a part of our last out final check that we've implemented at our workplace it just illustrates the importance yeah. of safety as well when, right. you're, when entering into zone four. When you see this big old, you know, flashy sign like back here, you feel like you got to say something. Mm-hmm. It reminds you that you got hearing aids in or whatever, right? Yeah. And, and as much as patients often complain about, well, somebody already asked me those questions. Right. A lot of times it, it takes the second, the third, the fourth right. asking, you know, before. Oh, too, yeah. oh, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> right. I really don't want to destroy my seven thousand dollar hearing aids by walking into the magnet room. Oh man, right? Yeah. <laughs> so we can go into zone four, and so zone four was extremely hard for me because it's laying out the the size of the magnet, of course, and trying because I want to do gauss lines. I had these big plans of doing all this kind of stuff, and I really struggle because you need cabinet space. Right. You need to make sure that that cabinet space doesn't really interfere, like how the doors open, interfere with your spacing with the magnet and how the table docks. There's, there's a lot that goes into it. And then also you want to be able to identify your gas lines. And you don't want your magnet to be too close up to the wall, right? Right. Yeah. So, so you want to make sure you have circulation all the way around your right. magnet. So even the lighting can, can, can oh, affect yeah, the image quality. Light bulbs. Yeah. Yeah, so um, it's getting harder and harder to get incandescent, you know, <laughs> light bulbs nowadays. But um, yeah, so an incandescent light bulb works because you're running uh, electricity through a thin right, filament. wire Water. filament, mm-hmm. um, and those guys can crack. Not crack if it cracks and and the the circuit is broken altogether, then your light bulb is burned out. Right. You know. But they can crack, and and the Microfine. broken pieces of the filament can still be touching one another. Right. Um, and then when you start running your pulse sequences, right? <laughs> filaments are ferromagnetic materials. Yeah. Um, and and you start running your pulse sequences, and now you have a, a time varying magnetic field that's bouncing around in there. Now these filaments are like touching, not touching, touching, not touching. And now you get, you know, corduroy artifacts in yeah, all your images and stuff like that. So, absolutely. Y- your choice of the, you this is room, the most right? bizarre stuff in the world. But the light bulb you choose to use in the room has the potential to affect image quality, right? right? right. The light bulb you choose to use in the room affects safety because now if you're using, you know, incandescent light bulbs, you know, Joe Bob from from maintenance department's got to come in with a step ladder, you know, twice a month to oh, replace the, sure, the, yeah. the the busted light bulbs, nice. um, and that introduces somebody new coming in with new equipment. You, you and keep talking about this Joe Bob guy. Like I know him. <laughs> <laughs> he must be from the south. <laughs> be from the Midwest. Well, Kansas City's kind of you know. South. <laughs> um, I mean. Do you feel like we've covered this topic? Yeah, I mean... Do you want to cover anything else? Do you think there's there anything that we didn't cover on this one, Toby? Toby, do you think we should? Um, so, so now that you have done this, and first off, I want to commend you. You've clearly put a great deal of both yeah. thought and effort into building this sleep so much these better problems. tonight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to point you to a couple of uh, potential resources yeah. for this. Um, so one of them, um, our... Radiology Planning, the firm that I work with, was sort of the the expert consultant for the U.S. Department of Veteran Affairs. Um, And last year they published, um, it's not specific, unique to MRI, but it's the Imaging Services Design Guide. Um, And as a taxpayer, um, we all paid to have this document published, and it's freely available to everyone. If you search VA Imaging Services Design Guide, it should pop up straight away. Um, But it is a resource, and it deals with essentially all of NucMed, all of diagnostic radiology, um, 
and it provides both kind of narrative descriptions of what the functions are, what the equipment does, you know, how you plan for it, that kind of thing. But it also includes sort of some graphical um, pieces oh, of information. Nice. Um, now, the information in the VA document is really sort of room specific. You know, this is what a magnet room looks like. This is what a control room looks like. Um, This is what a patient holding area looks like. This is what a change room looks like. And it doesn't really knit together um, all of those things to say, here's what an MRI suite looks like when you bring these pieces together. So the other reference that I'm going to give you that's not available just yet, it's something I've been working on with Metrosense. Um, We're using the building blocks that the VA document kind of created, you know, individual rooms, and we're building suites, um, and we're building kind of prototypical, um, you know, in the Goldilocks style, um, you know, simple, medium, complex, uh, small, medium, large uh, kind of of facilities. Um, And the plan is, fingers crossed, um, you know, later this summer, um, we're going to make them available, and oh, nice. everybody will have them as kind of prototypes. They're not meant to be, you know, copy and paste. This is the perfect solution. This works great for everybody because, right. given our earlier conversation about defining workflows, everything in the design really should, in my opinion, kind of be predicated on understanding the workflows. Um, but that being said, they're really good sort of point of reference for how do we put all of these building blocks together. Right. Um, so, um, so the VA document for now, freely available and coming in the next few months, the the new Metrosense kind of suite diagrams. That's awesome. Um, the other thing that we're doing with Metrosense that is super cool is we have all these sort of scattered references and resources, right? So, right. so I mentioned the VA, the VA is one. We have the ACR you know, guidance document now, the ACR manual on MR safety, that's another one. Right. I talked about FGI earlier. Yeah. Um, so, so there are all of these sort of resources that talk about different little bits of it. And we're actually creating sort of, um, I've been calling it a dummy's guide. I know Metrosense is going to come up with a much (laughs) better term that sounds less pejorative. Um, But we've essentially taken excerpts from all of these best practice reference documents um, and knit them together in sort of one document. And so it's... It is a dummy's guide. It's, you know, you have questions about MRI facility planning, layout, design. You know, what does this mean? How do I understand, you know, this zone versus that zone? Or what is a quench pipe? Or why do I need to be worried about it? Or why is it important to consider med gases, you know, brought into the magnet room? And what do I have to do to get piping for the med gases through the, you know, RF shield? The goal of this document that will go along with kind of the sweet diagrams is not to be the authoritative be all end all, but essentially to say, Hey, look, you know, for this question that you're asking right here, there's some really important information at joint commission at ACR uh-huh. at, you know, FGI. At, right. And it's, it's really meant to be kind of a roadmap right. with yeah. little clippings awesome. that say, oh, look, the thing you need to know about this is, you know, here's, here's a quoted paragraph or a couple of sentences. Right. And the idea being that if, if, Text and you know, right. who, looking to, to get a new magnet or or you know, uh, right. uh, you know, expand an MR service or something like that, right. or facility planners right. or you know, yeah. medical physicists or you know, any of the people who kind of sometimes get roped into these capital projects, who want a single spot to kind of turn for these resources. And of course, architects and engineers and, you know, real equipment planners. But my hope is that we really, we create something of a Rosetta Stone, right? Right. Because one of the problems with these capital projects is architects and engineers and equipment planners all speak architect, right? Right. And I was Googling things like crazy when I was looking at stuff. I'm like, what are you talking about? <laughs> Techs and radiologists and radiology admins, they talk patient care, right? Right. right. So these guys are talking building codes and these guys right. are talking, you CPT know, throughputs and, and CPT, throughputs. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. You know, and they, they can't have an effective conversation with one another. Right. And so if we kind of say, okay, look, 
you you know clinical folks and and acr standards and joint commission compliance right you know that information needs to come over here to the architects and the planners and that kind of thing and you architects and planners we're going to talk about codes and standards and we're going to make that information accessible nice. to you know the clinical sure. and operational folks yeah and we're going to take all of this and we're going to kind of put it into one document so that the parts you know you can skip over you know the parts that you want to know you know you can kind of hit those yeah without googling everything and trying to figure it out right no that's for sure well and we definitely will you know once that comes out and for everything else that he talked about today we'll put a link down in the uh, description so just look out for that check that out for sure it sounds like the evolution of mr suite design has changed quite a bit since you first started in 97 i think it was right yeah um one of the things that that sort of the, the formal recognition of that, and, it, and it's not unique to MR, but the- with We the, like to think we're special. <laughs> <laughs> of course, we're special, but you know. Um, actually, this was, this was something that kind of came about because um, I was on the ACR's MRI Safety Committee and, and one of the, the contributing authors to what was the 2007 document. And, um, Dr. Charlotte Bell, who is an anesthesiologist who was on the committee in 2007, and I think she continued on uh, at least for the 2013 issue. Um, she and I had this sort of sidebar conversation, and you know, she was talking about how important it was for anesthesiology to have medical gases in the magnet room. Um, and she kind of brought it to the, the ACR awesome. safety committee and said, you know, look, you know, when we're doing anesthesia cases, we got to make sure that you know we've got to stop bringing oxygen, oxygen tanks, tanks into the room. Sure. Um, and everybody was receptive to that, but at the time, the way that the guidance document was being structured was kind of yeah. lowest common denominator. We want to write something that is as applicable to as many sites as possible, oh. and not everybody's doing GA. Right. So. You know, they didn't want to put in a whole bunch of if then, you know, right. kinds of, of guidance because they were afraid that it was going to get kind of confusing. Well, there's a lot of variables to consider, right? Yeah. So, Dr. Bell and I sort of had this sidebar conversation. We're like, you know, what would be great is if there was sort of this tiered understanding of levels of acuity and levels of patient care, you know? Right. And if you were at tier one, you know, oh, you don't need to worry about medical gas, but you go to tier two and now we need to start thinking about it, and you go to tier three and absolutely. All right. So, um, with the FGI, the Facilities Guidelines Institute, um, we had the chance to implement exactly that idea that Dr. Bell and I had 15 years ago. Awesome. Um, and uh, there are now imaging classification system, class one, class two, class three. Um, and it's never, prior to this, it had never been applied in imaging, MRI or anywhere else. Right. Um, but it, it's applied in every other part of the hospital. In every other part of the hospital, we call them exam rooms, procedure rooms, oh, and operating rooms. Good point. Yeah. Right? Dang. Yeah. All of those are just rooms, right? Right. But the definition of whether we call it exam, procedure, or operating tells Changes us everything, right? what <laughs> kind of materials we got to put in, right. the airflow, you know. Even what you can wear in those type of rooms, Exactly. Right? The yeah. preparation, you know, yeah. uh, for, for going into the room, uh, scrub sinks, that kind of thing. Yeah. So... We have that three-tiered system everywhere else in the hospital. We just never did it for imaging because imaging was always diagnostic, right? right? We don't actually do anything to the patients. We just bring them in, throw them up on the table. We take the picture. We send them away. And somebody does something to them somewhere else. It's becoming more and more therapeutic. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. yeah. So we're the level of intervention, the level of patient acuity in imaging services over the last 20 years has just yes, skyrocketed. For sure. Um, and so now in the FGI, we actually have imaging classification system. And one of the ideas, and this kind of goes back to the workflow idea, is before you decide, well, this is going to be a 750 and not an 800 square foot, you know, magnet room. Right you have to d make a determination what classification what level of acuity or intervention are we going to serve you know patients right. in this room right because as soon as you make that determination are we just strictly diagnostic class one are you a class one but then you make the decision like 
you know, my MRI facility did when they started doing image guide, guided biopsies. And now all of a sudden they're doing class two oh, right. procedures. But in, in a facility that was designed to a class one right. set of criteria. So prospectively, preemptively, you know, trying right. to look in your crystal ball and say, okay, I know what we're doing today, but what are we likely to be doing three years, five years from now? Let's set our classification level to give us that flexibility going forward. Right. Nice. Yep. Plan ahead, right? Because MRI is moving. So yeah. You got to do what you can to keep All up. Aboard. <laughs> <laughs> Well, super excited to have you here today, Toby. Thank you for that. Yes. And thank you for those that are watching us and subscribing. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe. Hit like. Tell your friends about us. Uh, and let them know that Toby was on today's episode. Reggie, <laughs> you got anything? Yes. Um, this is Zone 3 Podcast, man. We really love all the support. So thank you, guys. Keep it up. And we're going to keep them coming. Thank you, everybody. We're out. <laughs>